Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. This video is the next in a series looking at the financial implications of Russia's invasion of Ukraine on the global economy. And in today's episode, I want to talk about Somalia. Now, Somalia is a country in Africa that's had trouble for a long period of time. And the United Nations have just announced that the country has over 7 million people who are now facing food insecurity and potentially up to 250,000 who may die of starvation in the next few months. And the reason that I wanted to talk about it today is that what's going on in Ukraine has caused this problem to accelerate. They already had some issues in Somalia, so I'm not putting all of the blame onto the Ukraine war, but what's going on right now with regards to food prices and fuel prices have certainly made things significantly worse. And also what we've got at the moment is a lot of pressure on the aid agencies. So a lot of countries around the world have been needing aid just to keep surviving. And what we've got today is a much longer and growing list of all of those countries who are needing bailouts. So it's putting a huge amount of strain on that aid system. So we'll have a little talk about that as well. So in today's episode, I'll give you a little bit of background on Somalia. I'll talk about what's been going on in the country and why it got itself into such a difficult situation. We'll have a look at the economy and what it produces and its balance of trade. We'll then talk about what's going on with regards to the fuel imports and the food market. And then finally today, I'll wrap up with my summary. So what I think is likely to happen in Somalia over the next three to six months and what the impact of all of this is on the global economy. So before we get started on all of that, if I could ask you to give me a thumbs up at some point during this video, if you're enjoying the content, and also please subscribe if you haven't done so already. And don't forget, I always include chapters. So if there's a section you're not that interested in, it's really easy to skip over it. And if you'd like to support the channel, please have a look below where you'll find links to Buy Me A Coffee, Patreon and YouTube Super Thanks feature. And I'm delighted to tell you that this video is brought to you in conjunction with Masterworks. Somalia is the easternmost country of Africa and is located on what's called the Horn of Africa. Somalia has a population of around 17 million people and has borders with three other African countries being Ethiopia, Kenya and Djibouti. The capital city Mogadishu is located just north of the equator. The climate is mainly dry and hot and apart from a mountainous coastal zone in the north, most of the country is extremely flat and around 60% of the population operate a nomadic lifestyle. Somalia has extensive coastline which fronts onto the Indian Ocean and the Gulf of Arden. The Somali language belongs to the Cushitic branch of the Afro-Asiatic language family. However, in view of Somalia's colonial past, many of the population have a good command of English and Italian. In 1973, Somalia adopted an official orthography based upon the Latin alphabet. Until that point, Somali had been an unwritten language. From a religious perspective, the vast majority of Somalia is Muslim. Somalia has an average life expectancy of around 50 years and has one of the highest infant mortality rates in the world. Somalia has a relatively young population and more than two-fifths are under the age of 15. Somalia's most valuable resources are its pasture land, which covers most of the country. The land does possess some mineral resources, including tin, phosphate, gypsum, coal, iron ore, uranium and natural gas. However, the quantity and quality are too low for mining to be worthwhile. Around 60% of Somalia's economy is based on agriculture. However, the main activity is not crop farming, but livestock raising. Agriculture in Somalia can be divided into three subsectors. The first is nomadic pastoralism, which is practiced outside the cultivation areas. This sector is focused on raising goats, sheep, camels and cattle, and has become increasingly market orientated. The second sector is the traditional, chiefly subsistence, agriculture practiced by small farmers. This traditional sector takes two forms, rain-fed farming in the south and northwest, and small irrigated farms along the rivers. The third sector consists of market-orientated farming on medium and large-scale irrigated plantations close to the main rivers in Somalia. The major crops grown are bananas, sugarcane, rice, cotton, vegetables, grapefruit, mangoes and papayas. The country's small fishing sector revolves around the catch and canning of tuna and mackerel in the north. Sharks are often caught and sold dried. In southern Somalia, fish and shellfish are also processed for export. However, over the last 20 years, Somalia's fishing industry has been affected by climate change, overfishing and increasing incidents of piracy along the coast. 
Alongside a lot of other countries, Somalia was colonised during the 19th century by the European nations, with Britain and Italy both setting up colonies in the country. Following the end of World War II, plans were put in place to give Somalia back its independence, and independence was finally declared in the summer of 1960. The first major problem that the independent Somalia faced was the last-minute marriage between the former Italian Trust Territory and former British Protectorate. The first independent government was formed by a coalition of the southern-based Somali Youth League and the northern-based Somali National League. The country faced difficulty bringing all its people together, and in 1969, more than a thousand candidates representing 64 different parties contested the 123 seats in the National Assembly. The newly elected president was subsequently assassinated in October 1969, and this provoked a crisis in the country and led to a military coup. The commander of the army, Mohammed Siad Bar, declared himself as head of state and president. And following his appointment, he announced a new form of communism in the country, referred to as scientific socialism, which he claimed was fully compatible with Islam. The president was hailed as the father of the people, and he developed very strong relationships with other socialist countries, including the Soviet Union and China. So much so that at the height of Soviet influence, slogans proclaiming a trinity of Comrade Marx, Comrade Lenin and Comrade Siad decorated official orientation centres throughout Somalia. Siad's authoritarian rule was reinforced by a national network of vigilantes called Victory Pioneers, by a national security service headed by his son-in-law and by national security courts notorious for ruthless sentencing. As part of the socialist ideology, all of the existing businesses in Somalia were nationalised and all forms of farming became state-controlled cooperatives. It is widely acknowledged that this experiment weakened the Somalian economy considerably. In 1991, after many years of civil unrest, an organisation called the Somali National Movement led an uprising against the president and secured control of the former British Somaliland northern region. They went on to declare that the 1960 independent federation was null and void and that the northern region would now be independent and known as the Republic of Somaliland. And despite the intervention and support of a variety of other countries around the world, Somalia has struggled to find inner peace over the last 30 years. And we've seen a variety of civil unrest over that time. As I mentioned earlier, Somalia does not have a lot of natural resources and therefore is a net importer. This table shows the exports of Somalia over the last 10 years. And as you can see in 2020, which is the last year that we have reliable figures for, the total amount of exports were $134 million. And the majority of that figure related to livestock, bananas, animal hides and fish. Now this table shows the level of imports that Somalia have made in each year of the last 10 years, with again 2020 being the last year that we have reliable figures for. And you can see that in 2020, the total imports were around $2.9 billion. And the vast majority of those imports related to food and fuel. And this table shows the balance of trade for Somalia over the last 10 years. And as you would expect, given the figures that we've just talked about, it is heavily negative in every single year. And you can see that on a cumulative basis over the last five years, Ethiopia has run up a negative balance of trade equating to $15 billion. And this chart shows the rate of inflation over the last five years for Somalia. And you can see that it has been increasing steadily over that period and is now running at 133% inflation. Now, Somalia is officially ranked as the second poorest country in the world after Burundi. And the classification of the poorest countries is based on a calculation of gross national income, which is a measure of the country's total income divided by its population. And you can see that in 2020, Somalia had gross national income of $310 per person. And this isn't gross income per week or per month. This is gross income per year. And as a comparison, in 2020, the gross domestic product per capita in the USA was $63,543. And as we've discussed before on the channel, in very poor countries, the population spends a much greater percentage of its income on food. And what's happening right now in Ukraine has caused the price of basic foodstuffs that are needed all around the world in places like Somalia to go up dramatically. We've seen an increase of more than 50% in the price of wheat and corn and other basic items. 
And the people of Somalia just can't afford any increase in those prices. Before we go any further, I want to say a few words about today's sponsor, Masterworks. Today, all investors face a dilemma. Inflation is at its highest level for 40 years, and the Fed is going through its most aggressive phase of money tightening ever. Top firms are predicting returns of less than 5% through to 2035, and restructuring your portfolio has never been more difficult or challenging. So where can you turn? What sort of assets are available? JP Morgan recently advised that alternative assets were something that seriously needed to be considered. And one thing that's caught my eye in terms of alternative assets is Masterworks. Masterworks has solidified itself as the platform for investing in contemporary art. Masterworks enables you to access exclusive art from the likes of Banksy and Monet for a fraction of the price paid for by billionaires for such pieces. Roughly two thirds of all billionaires allocate between 10 and 30% of their total portfolio to art, partly to diversify and partly to provide a natural hedge against inflation. And that makes sense because between 1995 and 2021, contemporary art outstripped the S&P index by 164%. And art has also exhibited the lowest correlation to equities of any single asset class. So if you believe that the equity markets are on the way down, then this could be an asset class worth considering. Since inception, Masterworks have sold three artworks, all of which provided a return of over 30% to investors' net of fees. As with all investments, there is no guarantee that past performance is an indication of future success, so you need to do your own research here. But if you are interested in Masterworks and you'd like to support the Joe Blogs channel, then you can skip the waitlist by clicking in the link in the description below. The rise in food prices that have been caused as a direct result of the Ukrainian war is having a devastating impact on an already fragile economy in Somalia. An example of this was provided in a recent report by Reuters, which reported on a grandmother who's living in a camp for displaced families in the Somali town of Dolo. She supports 13 members of her family by washing clothes in town and earns $1.50, which enables all members of her family to have a single handful of maize porridge. Another story reported in the African News detailed the costs of a taxi driver in Somalia. Before the Ukraine war started, 20 litres of fuel cost $15, However, it now costs $28, so that's almost double the price. Prices keep going up by the day, he said. We are considering parking our cars or even selling them. A market trader selling groceries stated that the cost of 10 bundles of assorted fruits and vegetables now only gets you three bundles. So that implies that the price has gone up more than 300% for those items. So I wanted to highlight those examples because I think they show the harsh reality of what's going on at the ground level here. So what's happening in Ukraine in Eastern Europe is having a massive ripple effect all around the world. And in places like Somalia, where they simply didn't have enough money anyway, and everybody was already on the breadline and potentially facing starvation, the increase in prices has really tipped things over the edge and has caused a major catastrophe in the country. This table shows the list of power stations in Somalia. And unfortunately, the vast majority of these stations are not in service. There are no power plants that serve the rural areas of Somalia and the few existing power stations that are still operating, which are located in the main cities, are often out of order or don't have enough fuel to be able to operate. And this means that in the areas of Somalia that do have electricity supplies, there are frequent power cuts and it's virtually impossible for any factories to be able to operate. The construction of dams for a hydroelectricity plant, as well as irrigation on the Jubba River, was stopped after the government collapse in 1991 and has never been restarted. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Somalia has a population of around 17 million, which is broadly equivalent to the Netherlands in Europe. Now, the maximum total capacity of all of these stations listed here, including the hydro station, which has never been completed, is 41 megawatts. And that compares to around 17,000 megawatts that the Netherlands have in terms of electricity generation. So as a result of the lack of power stations and the effective supply of electricity, 90% of Somalia's electricity is supplied through isolated diesel-based mini-grids operated by private energy service providers. 
So essentially, these are diesel powered generators that provide electricity on a very localized basis. And as you'll know if you follow the channel, the cost of diesel has increased by more than 50% since the start of the Ukraine war. So the people who are able to get some electricity are facing major problems because when you've got a 50% increase and you're one of the poorest countries in the world, it's impossible to be able to afford that. So essentially what that means is that they won't have any electricity at all. So any form of manufacturing or anything that they were doing that needed electricity will all have to stop. So again, this is another direct impact of what's going on in Ukraine, having a real localized impact on people who rely upon small amounts of diesel to be able to generate electricity, to be able to do things. But if you can't afford to buy the diesel, it means you can't generate the electricity, you can't produce anything, you can't sell anything, you don't get any income, therefore you can't buy any food. The United Nations has warned that 7.1 million Somalis, or nearly half the population, face acute levels of food insecurity, meaning that they will barely be able to get the minimum calories they need and might have to sell assets to survive. The agency said a fourth consecutive rainy season had failed in the country. And at the same time, world food prices are close to the record highs hit in March 2022 as the Russian-Ukraine war roils markets for staple grains and edible oils. Around 213,000 Somalis are at risk of starvation, a near threefold increase from the levels expected in April. According to the statement from the World Food Programme, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the Children's Agency, UNICEF, and the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. The UN's 2022 Humanitarian Response Plan is only 18% funded to date, and Somalia is competing with other global emergency hotspots for funding as food insecurity spreads around the world. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video because it's another reminder that what's going on in Eastern Europe right now is having repercussions all around the world. And the crisis that's going on in Somalia right now isn't 100% attributable to the war. However, it is getting significantly worse because of it. The statistic about the number of people in Somalia facing death by starvation increasing three times compared to the figure calculated in April is a direct result of the increase in the food prices at the moment and also the fact that there is massive amounts of pressure being applied to all of the aid agencies. So before this war started, we had a lot of countries that were ticking along but they were on the edge, but they weren't at the point when they needed emergency bailout and funding from the aid agencies. However, since the war has started, we've seen a number of countries tip over into crisis level. And that means that the aid agencies are having to spread their money around amongst different countries. So money that previously would have gone to Somalia to save some of those 213,000 people who are on the point of death is now being diverted to other countries. And another reason that I wanted to post this is that a lot of people who are sitting watching this in the developed world will be impacted. We're all going to feel the pain of this war. But we won't be impacted to the extent where people are starting to die because you don't have enough money for food. The situation may get really unpleasant and we may have to tighten our belts and cut back on spending and not do as many fun things as we did previously. But if you're looking at a situation where your family are dying because the price of a bag of potatoes has gone up by 50%, that situation really brings home how real the problems caused by this war are in a lot of countries around the world. Now, as I said, not all of the problems in Somalia are as a result of the Ukraine war, and it's probably impossible to be able to fix the situation. They've got a lot of climate issues, they've got civil unrest, they've got a lack of governmental control. So there are real problems in the country. But I thought it was worth talking through exactly what's been going on in Somalia, where they've got to, and what the situation is now, and what the impact of this war has been directly on all of the people of Somalia. In terms of what's the impact on the global economy of all of this, well, it's the same point that I've made in a few other videos, that somebody ultimately is going to have to pay to sort out all of the major problems that we've got. Now, we can't fix Somalia, but there will be a lot of money that will be put towards helping the cause, trying to sort out the situation, trying to keep some of those people who are on death's door alive. And ultimately, that will need to be paid for. The aid agencies need countries to give money to them, and the richer the country, the more they will contribute. So that will be added to the global debt burden. And what we are seeing here 
is the global debt pile is getting bigger and it's likely to continue increasing as long as this war carries on. And from where I'm standing right now, it looks like this war could continue for the whole rest of 2022. So we will see a continued increase in global debt and that's going to add more pressure because at some point the governments around the world will need to start increasing taxes, increasing interest rates and asking for all of its people to contribute to put the finances back into the black. So ultimately, we will be paying for all of this. It's emergency funding now. It needs to be spent. So nobody's arguing that we shouldn't be doing it. But in the long run, we will have to pick up the cost of all of this. So that will put more pressure on the global economy. We've already got a lot of pressure anyway. And as with a lot of other things, this could tip the balance. So as the world starts to deteriorate and more countries get into a bailout situation, we will need to be handing more cash out. And at some point, I think the global economy will say enough's enough and we will hit a global recession. So hopefully you found this video interesting, informative and educational. If you've enjoyed the structure and the content, maybe not the actual message because I know it's a bit depressing, but if you've enjoyed the way that I've put this video together and the information that I've provided, then please give me that thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already.